Welcome back to Dog Show Tips. Some exciting news this week. I'd like to welcome Canine Chronicle TV. So this week on Dog Show Tips, buckle up, we have Michael Faulkner. Brought to you by Canine Chronicle TV and ProPlan, nutrition that performs. Hi, Michael. It's good to see you. Thanks well, for like, Likewise. Good to see you. Things are all okay there? Things are well? Yep. Just here holding down the fort at the health clinic and uh, still working away. But it's nice to have a break and talk about mutual passion. Excellent. I'm glad you could join us. Thank you. Let's get right into it then. How did you get involved in the sport of dogs, Michael? Uh, well, I've been, I was born into the sport and um, been doing it my entire life. Um, uh, uh, three generations and uh, started a junior showmanship and worked my way up through. Okay, and so you obviously, um, right, right from the start, you got into our sport. Oh, wait. Uh, what people influenced you the most? Mentors or just people? Didn't that be dog people, anything? Well, you know, through the course of um, my involvement in the sport, um, numerous people have influenced me, but uh, the most, uh, the one significant individual would be Peggy Grayson. And uh, she's 100 years old. She's still alive and in assisted living in England. And she uh, took me under her wing as a youngster and guided me and introduced me to some of the best dog people in England as a kid. And uh, I went to shows and she mentored me about the essence of type and the, within the various gun dogs. And uh, you couldn't have asked for a better um, mentor and upbringing. Sounds like it. And uh, did you work for handlers as well? I did off and on part-time, never full-time. And uh, as, uh, when I had a break from college, I would go on the road with handlers and um, help them out. But basically um, I balanced college going on the weekend, showing my own dogs. And um, it's funny because um, when I graduated from graduate school, I was actually um, assisting a handler um, down in the shows in Georgia. And uh, they were also handling dogs for my mother and uh, a field spaniel import that my mother had just sent over um, was handled by the wife of the handler that the, the couple that I was working for. And um, my mother's dog beat this handler's dog in the group and he had just kicked off Houston Clark with his Springer that was the number one sporting dog in the country. And he, and so my mother's field spaniel won the group. He went second and he got really pissed and went out of the ring and uh, mumbled under his breath, who the F's dog was that anyways? And I was standing right there and I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, uh, that would be my mother's. <laughs> and, um, and then he got all red in the face and was uh, uh, eating humble pie and came up later that night and asked me if I wanted to come to his setup and have a drink and I did. And that established the partnership with my late um, partner, David White, and we became handlers together. Nice. Yeah, funny story. <laughs> you can, can you name any of the handlers you work for? Yeah, well, that was with Bob and Linda Stebbins. Well, I work and, for Bobby as well. I know. I know. Bob was a, a great guy and um, uh, a character and extremely creative and talented. And uh, I'm sorry he's not here today. Yeah. And then as a kid, um, back when Tommy Cohen and Steve Barger um, handled dogs together, uh, they handled my aunt's dogs. And uh, so as a, when I would travel to dog shows with my aunt and uncle and uh, um, I would help and run dogs for them and and uh, just uh, uh, I was I was a junkie and I was totally in awe of them and John Buddy at the time and uh, I I loved the whole that was just my whole life centered around the the collie and the Sheltie ring for several years. So your aunt bred collies then? Yes, and they they uh, actually handled several dogs for my aunt, um, including a. A blue merrill dog that did a, a, a great deal of winning uh, by the name of Champion Briar Hills High Voltage. Okay, wow. I didn't, see, I didn't know your collie background. Yeah, so yeah, so 
What's your favorite breed then, Michael? Well, I still breed, and I've been showing and breeding golden retrievers for um, over 50 years now. So, <laughs> right at 50 years. So I would have to say that that, that is one of my favorite breeds. And I've read and, I've read and, sh and exhibited several um, breeds and specialty and group and best in show winners, but um, I'm most known for golden retrievers. But I've also um, bred uh, English Springer Spaniels, um, pointers, field spaniels, um, pugs, and um, and then back uh, black and tan coon hounds. So, as a handler or as an owner, what was your favorite win? Do you recall a favorite win? Wow, I um, I think one of my favorite wins, as far as just sheer excitement, was back in the heyday when Louisville Kennel Club was black tie, and it was the group and best in show judging held in the evening um, in Freedom Hall and Annie Clark was the, uh, the commentator and it was on USA Network and uh, I had just come off of um, uh, my golden bitch had just won best in show at Detroit the weekend before and did over 3,300 dogs and then the next weekend was the four days in Louisville and she won the group all four days and then went best in show at Louisville at, for 5,400 dogs defeated on, on that day. Yeah. Well, that was pretty exciting. And then, of course, the times that, I, that my dogs have won the breed at Westminster and then placed uh, in, in the groups, that's always exciting. And, you know, seeing your dog win breeds at the national specialties, that's exciting. So there's a lot of them. Didn't you just have a national breed winner at the Goldens a couple of years ago? 2018, yeah. And, and Green Bank and I, who's from Canada, we breed, we breed and show together. And... Uh, it's a young bitch of ours, and she was uh, uh, first time first time out as a special in the states and wow. she won the national. So it was nice. The nationals are always exciting. They are, especially with golden retrievers, because it's a long, arduous process to get there um, from a judging perspective. Because there's so many dogs, and it takes forever. For sure, even just yeah. watching them at a regular show seems to take forever. Yeah. Uh, you have a favorite dog then? Um, to narrow down sometimes, but a, a favorite dog. I mean, I, I think that when I think of all the various breeds, and you know, not only from a uh, breeding perspective, but from a judging perspective, um, one of my all-time favorite dogs was the curly-coated retriever that won the group at Crufts, um, Daryl and Rifleman. Um, I just thought he was noble and majestic and absolutely captivating, and he sticks in my mind. Um, golden retrievers would be um, uh, the Davern Figaro dog. Um, that was also English bred and owned and there, um, I can't remember, um, Bob Stebbins handled a, uh, Irish Wolfhound bitch, bitch who did some group winning, but she, he didn't show her very often and her, her name was Fitzsaren Kelt and I was, I, I loved her and there's so many dogs of various breeds that I, I admire, you know, and, uh, so there are a lot of them. So there's, there's too many. It's hard to narrow it down for sure. Yeah. Give me a skill or talent that you have that most of us wouldn't know. Um, I'm an artist. Um, I have um, uh, I have four de degrees, and one of them is in fine arts. So um, I I paint, I draw, I um, sculpt, and uh, I have my studio. So that's something that most people don't know. And uh, the other thing is I'm a beekeeper. Oh, I didn't know that either. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that. That's exciting. Well, it's, um, it's something, uh, 15 years ago, I decided I needed something because I'm very active all the time and I need something to slow the spins and spins. So I, um, along with a fellow um, uh, in the community, or he was a retired doctor, and I said, listen, let's, let's go become beekeepers. So we went for our training and our courses every week during the middle of winter um, and uh, we got certified, and we got our hives, and the rest is history. That's amazing. That's an important thing. It really is. Yeah, it's not easy because uh, it's hard to keep the hives up and healthy because of uh, all the variables you have to tend to, and you lose quite a few of them, but you just you, you plug away. Wow. That's good. Um, 
Is there a dog from the past that you wish you could have owned or shown? Wow, yeah. Good Lord. Probably hundreds. Um, well, don't give us a hundred. Give us a few. <laughs> wow. Huh. I gotta, I'm trying to, well, one right off the top, I, I would love to have owned and shown Mystique. Um, I mean, I, I was in competition with her and, um, uh, and uh, every time I saw her at the show, um, I think uh, even though she, she, she beat my golden more times than I beat her, I think I have the record of the one dog that, that, that was able to win more best in shows over her at that time, but she was absolutely stunning. And not only was she beautifully presented, but uh, I had a lot of respect for Jane Firestone. As a, as a gracious lady and exhibitor, and that just uh, made the dog even more desirable. But she was beautiful. Yes, she really was. Any advice for new handlers, young handlers? I think um, don't expect, you know, there's this expectation that um, things are going to be easy and that. Um, um, everything should be immediate. And I always say, don't expect anything. Expect, expect, the only thing to expect is that you go in and do the best possible job that you can do. And based on a rich understanding of what's expected of you. So, and, you know, so often people just, you know, go in the ring without the history, without the um, professionalism or the dedication, um, to really truly understand the people that went before them and to understand what, what it takes to make it right. And they just walk in with the dog on the end of the leash and expect to win. And um, that's, that's frustrating. So I always say to new people, go in and do the best job you can, make sure you do your homework, understand your dog, the people you understand your clients, understand pedigrees, understand the history of the sport, and go in and do the best possible job. But don't expect anything. Is there any uh, a moment in the ring, either judging or showing, that was uh, you found too funny that you had to you you, you couldn't hold it in? in a funny oh yeah, uh, yeah, several. I mean, the one, the absolute one was uh, Golden Retrievers in Birmingham, Alabama, and Janie Forsythe was judging, and uh, it was hotter than hell. And it was one of those, it was in the farm um, fair building complex. And we were in one of the side rooms, just sweating. And Janie had a big um, summer skirt on. And of course she was tall. And uh, uh, Charlie Stewart Fippen, she's now a judge, was showing a golden retriever in front of me. And Connie Gerstner Miller was behind me. And, you know, and I was in front of my golden it was in the classes, bitch, stacking her up. And then Janie went to the rear of Charlie's bitch to examine her. And she bent over to the rear and she bent over. She came back up and my head got caught underneath her skirt. And I had a little trouble trying to get myself out of Janie's skirt. And I was flailing away. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I finally got myself released from underneath Janie's skirt. And the ladies were all laughing. But that was pretty embarrassing. <laughs> I bet you Janie wasn't embarrassed though. <laughs> no, she wasn't. No. But she got even with all of the ladies in the ring that were laughing at me because of that situation and I ended up winning the class. So that was fine. <laughs> That's a good story. What about today's um judging um how to uh, able to get your judging license now? How do you feel about the, the lap, that procedure? I know it's a tough question, but I think um you know, I'm not about checking boxes, and I think that there, there really needs to be a process of uh, really uh, understanding and evaluating the person for, for their, their history and involvement in the sport. And um, I'm actually applying for 12 new breeds right now, um, additional hound breeds, and it's the first time that I've had to go through this process, and um, it's, it's not fun. And um, I, uh, I wish that I could sit in a room and, and have a conversation about every breed I want to talk to judge and talk about that breed, uh, those breeds, and then put me in a ring with um, dogs and let me judge them. And if I do a good job, there you go. You get your license. Well, but, uh, 
this generic approach, I do not think um, generates um, quality judging. I love that. That was great. Um, I feel the same way. And up here, we're working on interview process as well, where uh, for a panel of, I think, four all-rounders will actually interview the individual and just discuss their merit, then actually put them in a ring. Like, that's a, that's a great idea. I think that's just, I, I really agree with that. I'm not going to go into it myself. But. How, how do you feel about the state of our, our gun dogs in America right now compared to England? Well, I think that, you, you know, gun dogs in general, I mean, we have taken um, form and function and exaggerated and stylized to um, create, and it's not, I mean, we can look, we can make, I can make this statement across the board of all gun dogs, you know, to streamline, straighten the fronts, overangulate the rears, and um, create dogs that um, um, racked and stacked create this exaggerated outline, but um, they have no, four, they don't have four legs underneath them and they, they aren't typical in uh, stature or movement going around the ring that represents a true functioning gun dog. Is there a breed you, you enjoy judging the most? Uh, within, within gun dogs? Um, I, 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 no, not really. I, lo I love them all. And um, I think that there's nothing more beautiful than an absolutely stunning pointer. And uh, I, I, it's just, they're just magnificent. And, you know, that, that makes my heart skip a beat. And um, I truly love the, the nuances of the various flushing spaniels. And, um, you know, I wish, uh, I wish they would get their due a little more than they, than they do, other than the English Springer obviously has always been popular, but just, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated and I've always been a student of the, the details that separate um, cousins within a family of dogs. And uh, I love that from a judging perspective to be able to understand and apply that knowledge of, you know, just the, the, the work under the eye, the, the arch over the brow, the, the, the differences of the back skull and the foreface and the make and shape of body proportions and angles that are just ever subtle between cousins, but yet they are paramount in defining breed type. So do you have in, in your mind's eye, when you're looking at certain breeds, do you have that one individual that's in your mind's eye that you compare these dogs? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny that you brought that up because as a youngster, when I was with um, Peggy and another um, um, mentor of mine, I was, a, um, I was in my teens. And um, back then, um, the, the Russian Zarina was still at her establishment and she married into English royalty. And there was a gentleman, Bill Garrett, who was the gamekeeper and he was the master of the flat-coated retriever. And, um, um, he took me to the kennel and he, and he called me young Michael and he said, I want you to, he took me all of these flat coated retrievers and he said, now you look at that dog right there. And he said, don't you ever, ever forget it. And he says, we don't need to look at any other dog in here. He said, it's not going to serve you in, uh, um, in a, a purpose other than you implant that in your mind, imprint that in your mind. And whenever you go in the ring, that's what you strive for. And um, you'll never have to uh, worry about it. And to this day, I carry that with me. And it's the same with every other um, breed. I think that as long as you see one great one, you're okay. I agree with that statement. And I think about it now, I think about the new judges up and coming that actually miss those generations of dogs. And I wonder what dog is in their mind's eye for certain breeds they, they are going for or judging at the moment. No, but it, it's a, it's a, I have a whole, I have a whole bank of dogs in my head that I got to watch over the years. And I feel fortunate that well, we're basically in the same era. And I feel fortunate that we got to see those dogs because there's, it's hard to see them now. I look at some breeds now and I think about, let's even as go back to Mr. Eldridge. What would he do now if he saw his breed? I, I don't know. But I'm sure you have yeah. breeds the same way. Yep. No, I, I totally agree. But, you know, it, and quite often, at least in my breed, in Golden Retrievers, um, you know, that one, I mean, you know, people say, well, it's such a hard breed to judge. And I go, no, it's not. It's just that it's really hard to find one that I can say, put that in, the, put that in your brain 
and don't forget it. And that's what you're striving for because you can judge a hundred and the, you're not going to find that. Or the one that's in there that doesn't look like anything else in the ring is intimidating to the novice eye and they don't have the fortitude or the, or the strength and their commitment to point their finger and award it the win. I consider myself lucky up here as a, while I was growing up and showing dogs, I got to watch Judy Taylor and Jen McCauley and I got to get that imprint in my head of what they made yeah. me look at and, and understand. Yeah. So yeah. I, that's why I, when I watch the breed now, I, I, it is a struggle. It is a struggle. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. I was, and it's funny. I was just the one thing about this whole, you know, um, the requirements for judging. It, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, a silver lining to it in a sense that, you know, I was able to, and through Zoom technology, I, I, was, I just came off of um, being mentored in the Oswalks and um, um, a gentleman by the name of Patricio, who they breed the best ones in the world from Italy. And I, um, I was able to participate and see, and I was afforded an opportunity to see one great one. I mean, stunning. And now I have that in my mind and, and uh, it's imprinted and now I have a, something to strive for where um, uh, prior to this, I would not have had that opportunity. So the, in the learning process does continue. And uh, I'm, but like you, I still believe it just takes one great dog. Is there a certain judge that mentored you at all? You oh, yeah, several of them. And I think that, you know, um, different judges for different things. Um, I think that, you know, um, you know, Annie was very useful when I first started judging on um, tips of the tr uh, 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 tips of the trade and um, uh, ring management. And, uh, you know, she always told me, she said, more often than not, you're going to have a class of seven to eight dogs in there and you don't really like any of them and you can't judge them on virtues. She said, don't bury yourself in the hole trying to find something good. She said, you need to stop and reverse judge. Look at the seven and say, okay, which one's the ugliest one? You put that over there. Okay, now which one's the ugliest one? You put it there. And then when you get done, you just go one, two, three, four. <laughs> so that was that. And then the other person who really um, was a dear, dear friend of mine. And I miss him um, every day. He's in my heart. And that's uh, um, Dr. Jones. Don Jones was a dear friend of mine. And he was always, even when I was in junior handling, he was always gracious and kind. And he was born a mentor, an educator. And um, to this day, I remember the first time I met him and our friendship lasted and spanned um, decades. And when I started judging, one of my first assignments was an international assignment with Don. And um, every week we would talk and he would ask me about uh, shows, judging, well, what did you find? And we would discuss details and uh, um, a, a, a true friend and mentor. And I miss him dearly. He was always fun to show to. I always enjoyed showing to Don. He came up here quite a bit. We got to see him a lot. Uh, anything else you want to add about judging? Well, I think, uh, I think that people take themselves a little too seriously when they get in the ring. And, the, you know, they, I, I always say, I'm not one. I can't stand, you know, I mean, even though I'm a, a, a fairly friendly guy, I don't care for this whole social aspect. I mean, I love to talk dogs and, and, and breed specific conversations. But, um, you know, it's just a dog show. And I think that you know, go in and do the best job that, that you can based on hopefully a rich understanding of the breed you're, you're judging. And always be mindful that your decisions should be based on moving breeding stock forward and not based on what's gonna look good in the group ring and maybe go best in show. And I've to, my, to this day, every breed that I judge, I wanna make sure that I judge it as a breeder judge. And, and that's my focus. Um, where's our sport going after this pandemic, Michael? 
Well, I, I'm, I'm a total optimist. So I, I, I truly believe that um, we're going to evolve and we're going to be um, um, bigger, better, and stronger. And I think that, um, you know, we have to be um, cognizant of the, the variables that we have to consider for safety and uh, consideration of fellow exhibitors and judges and kennel club me um, members. But, um, you know, we're going to weather this and, um, it, and I'm not worried. And, and I think that it's been, um, it, you know, I hate the fact that people have um, lost income and we've had to slow down and, and people are, are struggling. And, um, but I think uh, through and through, I think there is a new, there's going to be a newfound appreciation and respect for things that were taken for granted. And um, I think, um, I, I do, I don't think I know we'll come back um, bigger, better and uh, bigger and better. Yes, that's a very positive response for us. Do you have a, a timeline? Any ideas when you think the show is? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, even in, in you know, I, I know there's an upsurge um, and I, and, uh, but I think even in the state of Virginia, we're in phase two. And I think that um, uh, through the fall, I think there's gonna be shows. I mean, I know that I've already, I have a show in August that I'm judging in Greensboro, North Carolina that hasn't been canceled. And then I have shows that are um, a go in September. And, um, and so and they haven't been canceled. And, and then I have um, shows in November and they have confirmed with me that they have gotten the approval to hold those shows. So. Um, uh, I think that uh, uh, it's going to move forward, and um, and it's ba and it's going to be based up to each individual state, and um, uh, we'll see how it goes. Good, that's a good note to end on. I really appreciate this, Michael. Thanks for taking the time, and I know you're busy. So uh, thanks again. I really appreciate it. Thanks again, Michael. That was a great conversation. I hope you all enjoy what we're doing here. And if you do, don't forget to press like, share, and subscribe and that little notification button, too. And if you want to get a hold of me, you can email me at dogshowtips at gmail.com or you can check out our website at willalexander.net. Until next time, guys. Talk to you soon.